Excellent. My, am I on? Yes. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm glad you're here. Um, we're going to continue our series into Second Peter, and um, if you're just joining us, okay, because I'm going to give us a little bit of a uh, rundown of the first two weeks. Um, and uh, it's just good to be here. Cold weather and all, thank you for coming. And uh, I hope you find this to be a place where you can just learn about Jesus. And some of you come in this room and you're trying to figure out if he exists and maybe wondering why we're so crazy about him or maybe just why we're crazy. <laughs> Others come here and they, they sort of know Jesus, they believe he's real, but they don't understand enough to really take a step of faith. And they're going to learn that that is the walk with Jesus, you just know enough to take a step of faith and he gives you more. And others are here because we're trying to surrender more because we know the more we give up ourselves, the more he lives through us. And that's our greatest desire. And the challenge of following Jesus is it's not just this faith step, but your faith has to be based in truth. And the foundation of that faith is critical. And we've been talking about how over the years, people have spent a lot of time and effort guarding the truth. Because if the message of Jesus changed at any point in the last 2,000 years, by the time it got to our ears, then what we would believe is something false. And our salvation wouldn't be true. So it's critical that we understand the struggle that the church had and the church today has to hold on to truth because without it, we're really not anything. So we're in the third week of our series, and it's a series that we talked about the spiritual battle facing the early church in the first half of the, well, the second half of the first century, and that battle that, that happens now. Jesus had ascended to heaven, and the apostles were eyewitnesses. They were the voices of authority. They were dying away. And as their voice began to soften, others who had lies and false voices began to rise. False teaching would be, eventually be known as Gnosticism. It's so based on two primary truths. There's a lot of variants, but basically two truths. First, Gnostics would say Jesus was never human. He was just a spirit that looked like a human when he wanted to. That he never really resurrected, he never died on the cross, and he's not coming back. He was a spiritual being who was pure and holy, and he could never have stooped so low to become a filthy human, even for a minute. Second, they would say, it wasn't necessary that Jesus did anything for salvation because salvation doesn't come through Jesus. What they would say is salvation has nothing to do with sin or repentance or forgiveness or grace. They say salvation is based on just having the right knowledge. If you're smart enough to be God, you can be God. Some of the apostles we've been studying, like Peter and John began to warn the church. These false teachers were incredibly gaining traction within the church. They looked like sheep, but they were wolves. They were sent to destroy and attack the message. They were supposed to be followers of Jesus, but we learn in these texts they were followers of Satan. They were on a mission to deceive true believers. And as they got to the second half of the first century, the apostles who were alive began to realize they better start writing because they're going to be left behind and they need to let people know what's about to happen. We spoke of the importance of these issues because Gnosticism has grown now for 2,000 years. It's still the greatest threat to the truth of the good news of Jesus. We fight it every day in our church. We fight it every day online. If you look for it, you'll find Gnosticism in every cult, every false religion, and every belief system other than Christianity. So in week one, we spoke of sticking to the path that Jesus shared with us, and letters from Peter and Jude and John were letters from our divine mentors directing us today how we should respond to these false teachers. Peter wrote in 67 AD and warned of false teachers coming to the church. Jude wrote a few years later and said, hey, they're here. And John, 30 years later, would write and say, hey, they're taking hold. They're gaining traction in the church. They're going to destroy the message. So we're looking at a period from about 65 A.D. until about 100 A.D., and we're seeing this thing grow in the church as the apostles are starting to die off. And these letters were written to us 
Last week we learned that the letters from the apostles were guided by the Holy Spirit, that each word was ordained by God, each book of the Bible organized by God, and each book of the Bible perfectly prepared by and selected by God. He selected people to write that particular book. We talked about how Peter was the perfect person because of his life experiences to write 2 Peter. Nobody else had the credibility and the experience to write this book, and it wasn't accidental. We discussed how letters of the New Testament are more like portraits than pictures, how each one highlights what the writer wants us to see. They all contain truth of God. They all contain exactly what God wants us to see, but the way they're shared is through the perspective of the writer. We learned about the writer of the first book we're going to study, Simon, son of Jonah, Peter, the rock. We learned how he was uniquely prepared by God through the circumstances of his life to be the best person to write the most critical letter to the church at one of its most critical moments in history. He had something that brought his words power that no one else had. He had one-on-one, hands-on, side-by-side experience living with and learning from Jesus. As long as Peter and John and the apostles were on the earth, when false teachers came in, they would look at him and go, what are you talking about? I was there. But once these apostles began to die, we see a rapid growth of false teachers between 200 and 400 A.D. It's where all the apocryphal literature comes in. Remember those parts of the Bible that have all the secrets that the special knowledge that you don't have that's on every TV show today. Any apostle would have looked at those books and said, that's ridiculous. That never happened. And yet today, it's the hidden new mystery meaning in the Bible. Peter had a clear understanding of stepping out in faith, failing Jesus, witnessing everything, and then receiving the forgiveness from Christ that he knew he didn't deserve. So today we get to Peter's letter. But first, just a bit more background before we dive in. Remember the year is 65 AD or so. Jesus has ascended about 30 years ago. 1990 for us. Peter's about 65 years old. He's in prison in Rome. He knows that God has told him that his time is up. People he doesn't know will stretch out his arms in suffering, just as Jesus had prophesied. He's soon to be crucified. And he tells us in his letter that he knows that. He's fully aware of what tomorrow brings. Nero is the emperor of Rome. The city has recently burned. Nero blamed it on the Christians when actually he did it. And then he began to use their death for entertainment. He fed Christians to the lions. They lit the streets at night by taking Christians and lighting them up. That was the torches at night. While this is going on, John, the younger apostle, is relocating to Ephesus from Judea, where he has been, and he's going to serve as the leader of the church at Ephesus from about 65 A.D. all the way to 95 A.D. So now we know who's writing the book. Let's look at the purpose of this book for a moment. We're talking about 2 Peter, the second book Peter wrote. His first book was a book that... um, Um, basically told Christians who were being persecuted and and dying that it's worth it to persevere, that suffering is expected for Christ's followers. And now this letter, his second letter, is addressing Gnosticism in the church. Peter's second letter is written to provide direction to all who came after he would die. The apostles knew that after their death, the gospel message that they preached would come under attack. It would be challenged by a lot of people. It would be discarded by some But some would hold on to the truth, and those are the people Peter is talking to. In essence, they're aware that the church would need answers to the great questions of the gospel, especially those related to final judgment, Christ's future coming, and how to live life based on those realities. And these answers have to confirm the truth that Jesus taught. As this age draws to a close, the future of the Christian faith could not rest merely on the strength of stories told by people who walked with him. It had to be based on truth. Peter often will describe the difference between true knowledge of God and the ideas that are just lifted up by these false teachers. From the moment Jesus ascended to heaven, there's been a desperate need in the world for direction, for clear truth, according to real knowledge. After all, the church today is wrestling with the same thing. 
We all have still significant questions. Christians need answers that enable them to know God in accordance with the truth. The stakes are too high for guesses or theories or human solutions. And we're going to see in 2 Peter that three critical questions are addressed by Peter. The first question, can someone come to know God without knowledge of Jesus as God's son? In the 21st century text, there's overabundance of religious choices and choice after choice dilutes and softens and outright abandons the necessity for a belief in Jesus. We see that in false teachings all the time. Well, you can believe in Jesus, just, you need to believe this other stuff, though. You see, you need to know the truth. You need to have this knowledge. If you want to hold on to Jesus, go ahead. But he wasn't really God. He's not really the answer. He's just one of many prophets, many speakers, many answers. You see, the problem is you're too narrow. You're looking over here at Jesus as the only solution. And, and a more enlightened, brightened mind would obviously realize that he was a great man, but he wasn't God. And you don't really need that. What you need is knowledge. You need to make yourself your own God. Jesus is secondary. To put the question bluntly, can somebody come to know God without Jesus being at the center? Or to put it more bluntly, can you be saved and ignore Jesus? A true knowledge of God includes knowledge of Jesus as God's Son, the second person of the Trinity. He's fully God, fully man. He's not just our Savior, He's our King. For the apostles, Jesus had been given the nations as an inheritance. He sits on the throne above the world rulers and religious leaders. Peter tells us in this book, without question, a true knowledge of God has to believe, has to include a knowledge of Jesus as a son. Fully God, fully man, fully died, fully resurrected, fully coming back. Second, can one know God and yet abandon the lifestyle that you should follow if you profess Christ? In other words, can I follow Jesus on Sunday and then go do whatever I want the rest of the week? You see, can I just, maybe, maybe if I go to confession, maybe that'll work. If I just do whatever I want during the week and I go to confession, I can still call myself a Christ follower. Well, the challenge was, if you're going to say you're a Christ follower, if you're going to say you're his Talmudim, his disciple, one who wants to be like him, then shouldn't you in some way be like him. Your life should match up to what you believe. This is extremely common in our world today. Yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. Do I follow it? No, I don't do. No, no, I do what I want to do. I sleep with her. I, I live with them. I, I do this. I do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I love Jesus. Yeah. Oh yeah. I love him. Oh yeah. I'm all over that on Sunday. And Peter will tell us multiple times in this book, I don't know what you're loving, but it's not Jesus. You see, what happened with these people who came into the church is they began to bring their moral failures into the church. They tried to infiltrate the church with sexual perversions, incest, fornication, homosexuality, sexual permissiveness. They did these things and said they were following Jesus. How did they do that? Well, the Gnostic would say, look, the spirit is good, the flesh is bad. Whatever I do in the flesh doesn't affect my relationship with God the Spirit. So that's why you see letters from Paul saying things like, hey, I hear one of you is sleeping with your mother. What are you doing? Are you out of your mind? These false teachers were bringing in perversions. Not only were they bringing in sexual perversions, but they were promoting lying, deception, greed, manipulation, figuring how to get money out of people. You see, anything goes because they have special knowledge, and they're saved. Amazingly, the great gospel issues of our day are the same. Many people are trying to know Jesus and separate themselves from that reality. Many of them are trying to know Jesus and use him for their secondary monetary gain. Second Peter confronts those who would teach that sensuality and greed are acceptable parts of the Christian lifestyle. Third, can you know God and reject the notion that Jesus will return? In other words, if you believe in Jesus, you follow Jesus, you love Jesus, you know his teachings, can you follow him and at the same time say he's never coming back? Because that's what the Gnostics were doing. 
He's not coming back because he never died. He never resurrected. And there's no need for him to come back. We have knowledge. Jesus said, but I'm coming back to judge the living and the dead. And they would say, there's no reason to be judged. We are smart. We have knowledge. We don't need Jesus. Okay. Then you're not following him because he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. Peter's letter confronts those who deny that Jesus will return as a judge. Talks about the prophecies that speak to truth. We'll get into that. So Peter takes on the lies that he's going to face in this first century and the same lies that we all face now in our century. The aim of this book, Peter, we're bombarded with churches and television shows and radio programs and social media by people who use Jesus' name in vain. I don't mean that they're cursing. What I mean is, is they're making Jesus into something he's not. A much more common way of taking his name in vain. You are Jesus, but you're not the Jesus you said you were. These people, they act like they're educated, like they have special knowledge, like they have authority. Many of them have degrees in religions in front of the biggest divinity schools in the country who also are not following Jesus. Yale School of Divinity, Harvard School of Divinity. They're not studying Jesus. I don't know what they're studying, but it's not him. And it's not this book. And yet they go on TV with master's degrees and doctorate degrees from all these institutions that humans have said are places of what? Special higher learning. Translated, places of Gnosticism. In an insecure world where contradictory views of the gospel persist, we've got to have a sure foundation. We've got to know the truth. We've got to know what it's built on, and we can't waver from it. Peter's aim in writing this letter is, look, for those of you who are still following Jesus, you need to know your foundation. And he describes three aims in this book. First, this letter is written to establish, strengthen, and stabilize Christians in a knowledge of God. In other words, Peter says, Look, I'm writing to remind you of truth, to establish that truth in your life, and to stabilize you so that you can't be pulled to and fro from false teachers. Peter uses words like established and stability to talk about faith, faithful followers of Jesus, and then he uses words like unsteady and unstable to talk about false teachers. Second, the letter tends to rebuke, warn, and correct those among us who teach and reveal anything other than the true knowledge of God. In other words, there's specific warnings in here to people like pastors and teachers of the word. You better be on guard for yourself because you're going to be held to a higher standard. And if you mislead people, chapter 2 includes some of the most stringent, strongest language in the Bible, and it's directed against false teachers. Anybody who teaches a different gospel lives a different life or claims special knowledge. Peter says to us, just look at their lives. You don't need to know what they're teaching. Look at their lives. Do they look like Jesus or not? Are they following Jesus to the best of their ability? Is their heart turned towards God? Are they trying to do it for themselves? Are they bombarding you with requests for money? Are they they over here saying, well, I can give you something, but you got to pay me first. Or yeah, look at Jesus, I love him, but don't look at the affairs I'm having. Don't look at the way I lead my family. Don't look at the way I lead my business. Peter says, you look at their lives, you'll know. As a pastor and a teacher, it is impossible to study 2 Peter and to preach from this letter without seriously thinking about your own life and whether you should even be up here or not. Finally, this letter aims to reclaim the faithful who've tripped and fallen by false teachers. Peter's also writing to people who they know Jesus, they love Jesus, but they've been carried away by false teaching. And he's like, come back. You're going down the wrong path. You see, every path leads to a destination. You're not following Jesus anymore. You've got to come back. So, with all that said, what are you waiting for? Let's dive into 2 Peter. We're in week 3, right? Let's look at it. 2 Peter 1, verse 1. 2 Peter 1, verse 1. There it is. Simeon Peter, 
Simeon, Peter. Simeon, Peter. Simeon, Peter. Huh, it's odd. That's odd. Simeon, Peter, really. People would have noticed this in the first century. You're like, what? Remember, Peter's famous. Peter's a rock star. He's famous. Everybody knows Peter. Everybody knows Peter. Wherever you go, anywhere in Judea, Peter's one of the last apostles standing. Everybody knows who Peter is. He's also one of the loudest, probably best told stories of the apostles. Everyone knows who Peter is. Hmm. He got his name Peter from Jesus himself. Hmm. Peter, the rock. One name is all it really takes, right? If he just says, hey, this letter's from Peter, everybody would go, oh, okay. I know who this is. Yet Peter begins this letter with two names. Simeon, Peter. Odd. Not accidental. Peter begins this letter from prison on death row. Reminding himself and us of who he was and now who he is. He's essentially saying, I'm Simeon, the fisherman, son of Jonah, synagogue dropout, the one who lived life on impulse, unstable at times, my mouth ahead of my brain. This letter is written to you from Simeon. I can never forget that I was Simeon. One name is all it takes. Peter was in the mononymous category. You may not even know that's a word. Anonymous, mononymous. People who are mononymous are known by one name. They reach the status. Where we say one name, we know who they are. Sting, Bono, Madonna, The Rock, Mr. T, Elvis, Elton. But prior to that celebrity status, they had other names. Reginald Dwight became Eldon, Elton. Gordon Sumner became Sting. Lawrence Terode became Mr. T. I couldn't imagine getting a letter from The Rock. You know, The Rock? I'm sure that reminds you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and he said, hey, from the desk of Dwayne, The Rock. He knows he's famous. He just introduces himself. I'm The Rock. He's today's rock star. Yet Peter begins this letter with two names. Simeon, Peter. He's essentially saying, look, I'm Simeon. I'm the fisherman. See, Simeon in Hebrew means the one who listens. Which is kind of funny when you think about Peter. He's essentially saying, look, I'm the one who listens. Simeon, not this Simeon, a different Simeon, was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. If you remember, when, she, when uh, Simeon was born, his mom said, conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he's given me this son also, and she called him Simeon. You see, he's named Simeon because he hears from the Lord. That's what Simeon means. One of the 12 tribes. So with just one word of this letter, Peter tells us the most important thing we need to remember about him. He used to be Simeon. If you know nothing else about me, don't let me introduce myself as Peter without first reminding you that I was Simeon. You see, Simeon, Peter, who I was, and now who Jesus says I am. I was Simeon. Now I'm Peter. I sit on death row and I still can't believe it. I'm just Simeon, the fisherman. The son of Jonah. And then I met Jesus. And he saw in me something I could never see in myself. 
the very first words he said to me. He found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which meant Peter. You're the son of John. But you, note the tense here, will be called Peter. I listened. I'm Simeon. I, I found the Messiah. And Jesus says, look, you're Simon, the son of John, but you shall be called Peter. Notice the exact words. You shall be called. Future tense. Jesus says, look, not only do I think you're a rock, other people will affirm in you what I see. See, he didn't tell Peter, you are Peter the rock. He says, you will be called Peter. In other words, not only are you so solid, so big, so majestic, so strong, that you know I'll call you the rock, other people are going to see that in you. And they're going to call you Peter. Other people give themselves a name, but this one came from Jesus. So Peter knows he can't use the name Peter without thinking about the name Simeon. Humility is recognizing your true nature and knowing that anything good in you comes from God. You see, today, people all over the place name themselves one word. Or people name them one word. That's really impressive, not. What's impressive is when Jesus says, I have a word for your potential, and I'm going to make it happen in you. Amen. And people are going to see your potential because they're going to see me in your potential, and they're going to call you that even though you don't see it in yourself. In Galatians, Paul says it this way, if anyone thinks he is something when he is not, he deceives himself. We're nothing without Christ. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. We're going to study several apostles. Each of them have something very unique. Peter, every time he speaks, speaks, even though he's brash and he's got this voice and he says things before he thinks, when he does think, he's very humble. It's the craziest story of my life. Last week I walked through everything Peter did in his life, almost. And we just stood back in awe. And Peter would stand back in awe and go, yeah, no, I can't believe it either. You see, I'm Simon, the, the, I'm the fisherman. I, I did nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. The order here is important too. Anytime you see a list in Scripture, even if it's two words, it's a list. And the order is important. The most important thing always goes first. He didn't say Peter, who used to be Simeon. He says, I am Simon Peter. He says, you know me as the rock of the church, but please don't use that term without remembering who I really am and was. I'm the guy who couldn't have accomplished anything without Jesus. And he's just echoing words Jesus said. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I in him. It is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Simeon Peter, translated, apart from me, you can do nothing. All I've done and seen is because of Jesus, Peter would say. He named me the rock. He gifted, guided, and worked through me. When Jesus took other, over, others saw me, him, as the true rock. One day we were up at the pagan orgies in Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked, who do you think that I am? Who do people say that I am? I had no idea Peter would say. I was speechless for the first time. I didn't want to answer that. I didn't have a clue who he was. 
And then something in me blurted it out. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter said, I thought I'd spoken too soon, but Jesus looked straight at me. And he said, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you see the language? You will be called Peter. Now he has professed who Christ really is. And what does Jesus say? You are Peter. You've reached your potential. If you do nothing else the rest of your life, you're Peter because you professed your faith in me revealed to you through the Holy Spirit. You are Peter. Not you will be. Not they will call you. I, Jesus, am affirming based on your statement of faith that you are Peter. You're a new person. And I'm going to build my church on that. People from all over the world with these names that represent their past, that didn't honor me, that didn't respect me, that didn't do the things they should have done. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal to them that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, and they're going to say what you said from their heart, and they are going to become the name I've given to speak to their potential. That's what the church is built on. That's what's going to happen for the next 2,000 years until I come back. Peter would say, when Jesus first met me, he, he said I'd be called the rock. And then on that day, Jesus says, I am Peter. And as soon as I thought I'd arrived, as soon as I started thinking of myself as the rock, I failed him. Should have called me the chalk. Because when he really needed me, Peter the rock, when he needed me to be the rock for him, I folded like a cheap deck of cards. I fell. I folded. Three times. And I cursed him while denying him. He called me the rock. Should have named me Chalk. Yet one morning at breakfast... Jesus said something incredible, something I thought would never happen. I thought when I denied him, he called me the rock, but I wasn't going to be a rock anymore, and he'd never forgive me, and I'd never be the person I was supposed to be, and I'd thrown away all my potential, and yet I walked onto a beach, and Jesus is standing there, he looks at me right in the eyes, and he tells me, do you love me? Three times. Three times answered. And incredibly, even though I had completely failed him, he still told me to feed his sheep three times. Can you imagine Peter as he heard those words? Peter, one day they're going to call you the rock. But today, Peter, this day, even though you betrayed me, even though you denied me, even though you took God's name in vain, listen up, Simeon. Listen up, Peter. You are still Peter because you're my rock and you can't stop what God's going to do in you. Why? Because the transformation of who we are and who we will be, Peter, is based on forgiveness, not knowledge. It's not what you know. It's being forgiven for what you didn't do right, Peter. You see, you came and sought forgiveness. Experience my grace and my mercy and my love, and you, Simeon, have been forgiven. You are and will always be Peter. And by the way, Peter, it's this forgiveness, this transformation that builds my church, and the gates of hell can't do a thing about it. So when Peter first meets Jesus, his name is Simeon. And Jesus tells him, You'll be called Peter the Rock. At Caesarea Philippi, Peter, you are now Peter the Rock. When Jesus warns Peter of Satan's impending attack, look at how these names are used. Don't miss this. There's power in names in the Bible. Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I pray that your faith would not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, 
when the rooster crows, will not crow this day, but tell you to deny me three times. Simon, Simeon, your old self. Satan's trying to tap into your old self, Simon. I've prayed that you wouldn't fail, Simon. I've prayed that you wouldn't go back into that flesh nature you had before you knew me, Simon. Simon, Simon. Satan has demanded to have you. He wants you back. But you're mine. You're mine because of that confession you made, that faith statement you made. Satan still wants you back, Simeon. And I pray that you wouldn't fail. And once Jesus says that, what does Peter do? He affirms his faith in Jesus again. I'll go with you both to prison and to death. What does Jesus do? Reminds him that he's Peter. 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 The rooster won't crow this day three times before you deny me. Simon, Satan wants you. Peter, you're going to deny me, but you're still Peter. You see, because your faith, your salvation, your name in me is not based on how well you walk after you surrender to me. It's based on the fact that you surrendered to me. As soon as in Caesarea Philippi, when you said you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, you are then and forever a new person with a new name and a new nature. And you will have moments when you go back and look like Simeon and act like Simeon and Satan's going to try to take you back into your past, but you will never, ever not be who I said you were when you professed your faith in me. You see, you've been reborn. You're a new person. You can't go back. Satan can try to drag you back, but he has no power over you. You see, you're Peter. And in this passage, Jesus, who is the master teacher, uses Philip, or Simeon and Peter's name to bring effect of who he was and who he is. You see, Peter didn't learn this on his own. Jesus taught it to him. And then when he's restored at breakfast... When Jesus asks him if he loves him, do you know what he calls him? Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Simon, son of Jonah, you see, you failed me, and now you've gone back trying to be Simon again, because I know you think I'll never accept you back. So I want to take you back to who you were and get you to break that profession again. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Do you love me? Lord, I, you know everything. You know I love you. And what he's asking Peter is, do you know that? Do you know that? Do you realize that even though you failed me, you're still Peter? And you're still the rock. And I'm still going to build my church. Go tend my sheep, Peter. you got a job to do. And it's not fishing. You're the rock. All of us in our weakness seem like chalk. But empowered by the Holy Spirit and surrendered to God, we all become like a rock. Strong in our faith. Stronger than we knew we could be. Why? Because it wasn't that Peter was a rock. Peter was just revealing the rock that was now in him. Peter People are going to remember that you're Simon, but once they see me work through you, they're going to know you're a rock. You know why, Peter? Because they're not seeing you, they're seeing me. And I've always been, and don't miss this, the rock of your salvation, the rock of ages. The prophets foretold of this. Isaiah this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts me will never be dismayed. Isaiah saying, the Lord is sending a stone, a cornerstone to Jerusalem, to the Jewish people. The foundation of everything. He's coming. He's perfect. He's the stone. He's the rock. And once the cornerstone is set, it became the basis for determining every measurement in the alignment of the construction. You see, the cornerstone had to be perfect, or as close as man can make a perfect stone, because they set it where they wanted it in the corner, 
And then every wall, everything in the entire structure points back to that place, to that stone. If that stone is off, the building will collapse. If the foundation is not pure and true, it will not stand the storms. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm the cornerstone. Whatever you build, if it's not pointing to me, aligned with me, in sync with me, it too will fail. Because I'm the rock. If the cornerstone was off, the whole structure collapses. And what Peter is going to tell the Gnostics, if you base your faith on anything other than Jesus as the cornerstone, you'll collapse too. Isaiah. Stand by. And no, I'm not dizzy yet, which is good. Um, So this is what the Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. Since ancient times, builders have used cornerstones in their construction projects. It's placed at the edifice. It determines everything. It's the largest, most solid, most carefully constructed, most valuable everything in any building. If you don't know the cornerstone, you don't know where it is, you can't build anything. So once the cornerstone is set, it becomes the basis for determining every measurement, every plumb line, every brick, everything set is in alignment with the cornerstone of the building. And what Peter's going to teach us is, is that our lives are that process of aligning ourselves with our cornerstone. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and be taken. God tells us through the prophet Isaiah, I'm sending a tested rock, a perfect cornerstone. For a sure foundation. For some people, it will be a rock of protection, a sanctuary. But for others, many of the Jews, both nations, north and south, he will be a rock that they will stumble on instead of build upon. Paul, speaking about those who lived in the time of Moses in the desert, said this. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. He's always been the rock. Then note the irony is Peter, the new leader of the church, heals a lame man. Peter, who they call the rock, who knows that the only rock in him is the real one. He preaches to those who killed Jesus. Look at what he says. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. The builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we should be saved. Peter's saying, look, he was the one Isaiah prophesied about. He was the stumbling stone, and you tripped right over it because you killed him. He says, look, they call me Peter, but the real rock, the one you're really seeing, is the one you killed. Jesus is the rock. He's the cornerstone, rejected by you, the supposed builders of the temple. And any Gnostics listening, by the way, there's no other salvation based on any other foundation. There is salvation in no one else, Peter will tell us. Later in his first book, Peter cleverly called 1 Peter, Peter the Rock tells us about the real stone of salvation. Listen to Peter's words. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious... Simeon Peter, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones that are being built up into a spiritual house to be holy, priesthood, 
to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that becomes, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. What Peter's saying is, look, it's not just me. You could take your name and add Peter to it as well. You see, because we've all become part of the temple. We've all become part of the spiritual house of God. All of us are rocks, perfectly aligned with the cornerstone, holding each other up, supporting each other, building a foundation based on truth that won't waver when the storms come. And he says they stumble because they disobey the word and they were destined to do it. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Amen. Simeon, Peter, you were once a people. Now you are God's people. You see, we all make up this wall. Every one of us. As the cornerstone, the building of the church, Jesus is our measure of alignment. Don't miss this. It was the relationship each stone had with the cornerstone that made the building strong. If one stone is aligned separate from the cornerstone, that building will not hold when the wall gets tempted in their area. Peter says, look, every one of you is a living stone, and you're arranged in a royal priesthood. And he says, hey guys, with Jesus, we're all a rock, every one of us. And we're perfectly aligned to be a wall. What are we supposed to be a wall to? False teaching. Gnosticism. Each of us holds up truth. Each of us aligns with the true cornerstone. Each of us has become a rock because in Christ, all of us have become like Peter. As he is manifested through us, as his truth comes through us, as his unwavering truth holds in us, we become part of his wall. Jesus is either your cornerstone and your rock of salvation, or he's a stumbling stone that you're going to reject, and you're going to trip over, and you're going to get destroyed. Everybody has to deal with the cornerstone. It either leads you home or it leads you to hell. But either way, one thing's clear. The rock never moves. Jesus never changes to be what you want. He never changes who he is. He's the cornerstone. He's perfect. He's true. He's unwavering. He's solid. He is what he is. And you're either going to embrace it or you're going to stumble over it. And that's what Peter's telling us. He'll be the rock of your salvation or he's going to be the rock of your destruction. It's totally your choice. But he's not changing. Two words. Two words that tell an entire life story. Two words that capture the essence of the gospel. Two words that reveal the power of the transformation of Christ. Simeon, Peter. Two words that explain everything anybody needs to know about him. Note this. When Peter's speaking in Acts... Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, and they were astonished, and they recognized they'd been with Jesus. Notice the validation here. Uneducated, common men. Yep, Simeon, Simon. Been with Jesus. Yep, Peter. That's how this letter begins. If you know nothing else about me, know that I'm Simeon Peter. And after two words, we have to stop and step back and be astonished too. Simeon has been with Jesus. He's become Peter. And in the next few pages, he's going to speak to us about what he knows with boldness. And we're going to stand back astonished. How could such an uneducated, simple man, Simeon, teach such truth? Well, it's because Jesus is in him. 
He, like almost no one else, has been with Jesus. That's how this letter begins. Simeon Peter. All of us have a name, by the way, that reflects the full potential of who Jesus sees in us. In many ways, we're a rock because the same foundation, the same rock is in us because we reflect Christ. We'll reflect everything about Christ. Our name could be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. But there's a name, I believe, that Jesus has for each one of us that strikes our full potential when we're fully engaged in the Spirit. I don't know what that is yet, but I believe upon arrival to heaven, Jesus is going to look at us and go, oh, you're Frank, but I call you whatever it is. I can't support that in Scripture, but I believe it's true. There is another reason I believe that. Not every name is revealed. Not every name of Jesus is revealed. Jesus himself has a name that reveals his full potential, and we don't know what it is. Revelation 19, verse 11. And then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Jesus is a God of potential. He sees who you're going to become when you've confessed that he is the Lord. Two words, really. Who we were before Christ. Second, who we'll be when we surrender to Christ and live fully in Christ. It's the story of Peter's life. It's the story of every believer's life. It's our story. Next week, we're going to pick up where we left off. 1 Peter 1.1. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Servant and apostle. Two words. Servant and apostle. Two words. Hmm. Stay tuned for next week. Hopefully we'll go more than two words. I hope you know that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not living in the potential of who God created you to be. Peter didn't become Peter. He didn't become who Jesus said he would be until he professed faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter didn't have to have special knowledge. He didn't have to do a bunch of good things. He didn't even have to stay perfect after he knew Christ. He just had to confess and receive forgiveness. But many of you who are listening, maybe in this room, online, you've bought the lie of Gnosticism. You've bought the lie that it takes knowledge or good works or something else. When Jesus says over and over, no, no, it's real simple. You either believe that I am who I say I am because I'm the cornerstone and I'm not changing and I'm not going to try to fit your idea of who you want God to be. I am who I am. You either surrender to it, accept it, and become a new person in Christ by recognizing that I am God. I died on the cross. I resurrected. I'm coming back to judge. And you can have salvation in me, but it only comes through professing that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in that, you become a new person. Anything short of that declaration, of that move from your heart, will keep you over here in your old self, maybe cleaned up a little bit, trying to perform a little bit, but you'll never know the salvation or the truth of why I came. So if you're here today, or you're listening online, and you're beginning to understand that you've just been given Jesus lip service, it's time to decide once and for all. That stone is in front of you. You're either going to align with it, and become part of the church of Jesus and become the person he designed you to be, or you're going to stumble over it and die and spend eternity in hell. It's that simple. But he's not changing. And in many ways, this sermon is his rock being placed in front of you right now, demanding a decision. Let's pray. God, sometimes we think we're all that, and we're nothing. And it's always refreshing to see a man who I would say was just a pillar of the faith, remind us, no, I'm just Simeon. But I met an incredible Savior who made me something I could never have been. 
Yeah, you call me Peter, you call me the rock, but all you're seeing is Jesus in me. I'm, I'm still a, a, anything I am is just because of him. So God, many today don't know you. They've been trying to earn your favor. They've been trying to work their way back to you. They've been trying to come to the right religion. They've been trying to figure out a way to reconnect with you because everybody deep down, every human on the planet knows that something's missing, that we're not complete. And we know somehow, God, we seem to know that it's spiritual, that the part of us that doesn't make sense has to do with you. And you put a desire in our heart when you created us to reconnect with you. So God, I know there are people listening that are thinking, how could this be? How could it be this simple? I just believe Jesus is who he said he did, that he died on the cross, that he died for me, that I'm a sinner, that I've made mistakes, I've hurt people, I've hurt myself, I've hurt God. I don't deserve anything. But Jesus says, I know, I know, I know, it's okay. Because you too can be like Peter if you just profess the truth. So God, for those who are listening, I pray that your spirit moves in their heart to show them that the first part of their life, the Simeon part of their life can end. And they too can walk in newness of life through profession of the truth of who you are. It's real simple. God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I know the only way I can be saved is to come through you and accept what you did on the cross as a very real human, a very real God for a very real hurting person, me. And with every ounce of my being, I accept who you are. I surrender my future, myself, everything I've been, everything I'd hoped to be to you so that you can make me who you created me to be. Jesus, I love you. Please save me. In Jesus' name, amen.